Let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you all, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity to work with all of my brothers who have been presenting thus far. And I'm just asking God to give me a double portion of the spirit that he has given to them as we prepare to go through our study this evening. You have already been hearing a lot about the first angel. You've heard a lot about the second angel. But beginning to, at this point and continuing in closing tomorrow, we will now give emphasis to the third angel. And there are many things that God wants to say to us in relation to this message. And now I'm just going to let you know up front, we're not going to be able to exhaust it all. The, the purpose of these messages is to stimulate yours and my mind to dig deeper and go deeper into personal study. Amen? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to get some gems and some foundational principles that I believe will help us in our walk and our understanding of God and his present truth. But my prayer is that you will not just walk away with what you've been fed this weekend, but that you will take these appetizers and go deeper into the entree of truth that God has reserved for each and every one of you. Can you say amen to that? All right. As we prepare to receive the word, I once again want to pray, and I'm going to do that upon my knees. And I would like to invite as much of you as are able to, to please kneel with me. If you cannot kneel, just reverently bow your head where you are. But if you can kneel, let us kneel together and let's ask the Lord to prepare all of our hearts to receive the word. Our loving Father, we are very grateful for this privilege and opportunity to study, to show ourselves approved unto you that we can be workmen and workwomen that need not be ashamed for we have rightly divided your words of truth. We pray that you would do something special during these few moments that we are together. Minister not merely to our minds, but especially to our hearts, that we might truly be converted. For this is our prayer that we do ask. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, amen. 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 When you think about the third angel, if you would like to read it from your Bible, or if you know it by memory, then you can certainly feel free to repeat it with me. In the third angel's message, we read in Revelation 14, and we start at verse 9, and we take it over to verse 12. In Revelation 14, starting at verse 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Verses 9 to 11 is what we summarize it as warning. All through verses 9 to 11, all we get is a warning. It is verse 12 that brings us into the experience that we desperately need so that we can overcome from that which we were warned about from verses 9 to 11. In my closing message tomorrow, a call to endurance, I will be focusing heavily on the principles in verse 12. But tonight we're just considering the warning that is given from verses 9 to 11. And we saw in verse 9 that the warning is based on an issue of worship. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall, and then it goes into all the things that those individuals will suffer. There is no way that we can understand Revelation 14, 9 without going to the previous chapter, which is Revelation 13. Obviously, because of time's sake, I'm not going to go through that in depth with you, but what I encourage you to do to really appreciate the third angel message warning is you need to look at what we're being warned about and what the devil is setting up in Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, we have three beings or three entities that are being worshipped. Three things that are being worshipped. The first thing that is mentioned is the dragon. The next thing that is mentioned is the beast. The final thing that is mentioned is the image of the beast. 
The Bible specifically says in Revelation, the 13th chapter, that these are three entities that are going to seek to steal or take away the worship and the fidelity that, owe, that we all owe to God. It is going to try to cause us to commit fornication, to enter into, uh, you know, to enter into illicit relationship with the beast and with the dragon and with the image. And so this is what the third angel message is warning about, is not to fall into this trap of worship. And that's why the title of the message is a call, will all the true worshipers please stand up? And so you will find, because false worship, it truly is the religion of the day. False worship, we are surrounded by it. And there are many ways that it is manifested, of which we're going to study tonight, and we're going to seek to dig just a little bit deep into the Word of God. The first thing I wanted us to look at when we're thinking about this is none other than our first slide. So we're going to go ahead and go into the four areas of study that we're going to look at, four questions we're going to seek to answer in our study tonight. Number one, who's receiving worship? We need to answer that question. Number two, what does worship mean? We all have different concepts. I come from a background of Baptist and Pentecostalism. And because of my Pentecostal back, background, I can remember if somebody talked about worship, I would say, oh yeah, that thing that you do where you clap your hands, stomp your feet, and wave side to side. We would say, that's worship. You know, because that's the background that I come from. You might come from a different background where worship means something completely different to you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to let the Scripture be the key that unlocks Scripture. We're going to let the Bible explain itself as it relates to what does worship mean. The third question, which is really a deep question, I'm hoping to spend the meat of our time on this question, is how does Satan get people to worship the beast and its image? That has to be a pretty amazing trick that he's going to do. And so I need to understand, and I think you need to understand, how does Satan get the people to worship the beast and its image? Question number four, what does God want us to do about this? These are the four questions that we are going to seek to answer in the few short moments that we have to study together. So let's dive into the Word. Number one, who's receiving worship? When we think about the question, who's receiving worship, you'll remember there were three entities, the dragon, the beast, and then the image of the beast. Well, here it is that when we talk about the dragon, to identify who the dragon is, the Bible spells it out very clear. In Revelation 12 and verse 9, the Bible makes it clear that the dragon is none other than Satan. The text is on the screen. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so the Bible makes it very clear that when we think about the dragon, we're thinking about none other than who? We're thinking about Satan. Satan constitutes that dragon. However, Satan is a mastermind. And there's a motif, there's a way that Satan often likes to work through Scripture. He often will work through people and through population. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Number one, as an example, you'll remember in, Pete, in, in Matthew 16, in verse 23, this is when Jesus was telling the disciples that I'm going to die and on the third day, I'm going to rise again. He was in Caesarea Philippi when he was telling them this. And then Peter, at one point, this is what, man, this is deep. Peter, when Jesus asked, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? You'll remember that they gave all sorts of answers. Some say that thou art, the, thou, you know, are Elijah or the prophet or whomever. And then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And then Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Peter said that, Jesus made a profound statement. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed that unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Meaning that the Spirit of God was guiding Peter as he confessed Christ, which perfectly fit with 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. No one can confess Christ except it be by the Holy Spirit. So it made perfect sense. But isn't it deep that by the time you get down to Matthew 16, and verse 21, just a few verses down. In other words, just a little later in the walk. Jesus says, I'm going to die, and on the third day I'm going to rise again. And then all of a sudden, Peter gets in front of Jesus and begins rebuking him. The same Peter who was just being led by the Spirit of God. And now here it is that Peter's rebuking him, 
And then Jesus says, get thee behind me. And I love how the Bible says it. It says, then Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. And so in that moment, that's what we call momentary demonic control. In that moment, that's why even if you did something great under the power of God's Spirit, don't get gassed up about it. Don't start dropping your guard. Don't start thinking that you're now little Mr. or little Mrs. Holy Person. You need to recognize that if God used you once, you just made the devil mad. And he's going to double up his efforts to try to take you down. And so it is that he had success with that man Peter to the point that Satan's now working through Peter that Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan, though he's talking to Peter. Can you imagine that? Satan often likes to work through mediums. It is not just Peter, but you'll remember it was in John 6, 70 and 71. Jesus said to the disciples, he says, I did choose you 12, didn't I? He said, yet one of you is a devil. And then it says he was speaking of none other than Judas Iscariot. And so it is that there are times that the devil, again, will try to work through mediums, work through people, work through powers like pagan Rome. In Revelation 12, verses 3 to 5, it speaks about a red dragon. And it talks about a red dragon that was trying to persecute a man-child. And that as soon as the man-child was born, that that red dragon was standing right there, ready to go ahead and try to kill it. That was none other than pagan Rome, of which Satan was working through. Are you following? And so it is that the Bible makes it very clear. That was in Matthew 2 and verse 16. You can read about it. God wants us to understand that the dragon at the end of the day is Satan, but Satan will often work through mediums, people, and populaces. In other words, nations if he can. If you're understanding what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. All right. Well, here it is that now, as we continue in this uh, little study here, we're going through the beast. Because remember, it's not just the dragon that wants worship. The beast wants worship. When we think about the beast, is it coming up on the screen? I'm seeing it here, but I'm not seeing it anywhere else. Are y'all seeing that? Are we on the beast slide? Do you see that? I heard yes, and I heard no. Which one is it? Okay, you see it, right? All right, I'm trusting you see it. All right, good. So when we look at the beast, you see the dragon. Now let's look at the beast. When you look at the beast, the beast is a dominating kingly power. I think there's been enough expounding upon Daniel 7 and 8 that I pray I do not have to go through it meticulously. I would recommend if you don't understand this, go back and study the verses out yourself. For time's sake, I'm kind of going through it, okay? In Daniel 7, verses 17 and 23, the Bible's very clear that a beast in prophetic language is often interpreted as a kingly power that is dominating. It's a dominating kingly power. Now, when it came to, in Daniel 7, the fourth beast, the fourth beast made up, uh, and, and Pastor John Ross did it very beautifully, so I'm not going to go too deep into it, but that fourth beast made up Rome, of which we would call pagan Rome. But it also talked in verse 24 about this. It then said this point here that I think is very important for us to consider. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first. Very deep, very important. And he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a times and times and the dividing of time, 1260 years, of which, are, as already has been identified, constitutes none other than the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church system. So when we're reading about that beast that is being worshipped in Revelation 13 or seeking to be worshipped, it is speaking to none other than the Roman Catholic Church system. If you understand what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen again. All right. Now we got the image of the beast. When we deal with the image of the beast, Pastor John is going to break it down tomorrow, so I'm not going to go terribly deep on this. But nevertheless, when we look at the image of the beast, the image of the beast is a governing power that deceives the people into setting up the union of civil and religious power. Very important. A governing power that deceives the people into setting up the union of civil and religious power. 
better known as church and state. Daniel 2, you'll remember that they had the feet of iron and clay. And when we looked at that feet of iron and clay, we already know what the iron represents because iron was already in the legs. Iron was Rome in the legs. Iron is still Rome in the feet. But the clay was a very interesting element. That's never been inside of any setup of the statue of the dream or the image of Daniel 2. And so when we look at the clay, the iron represents Rome. That was a civil power. But the clay equals the church. It equals God's people. And so when we look at the feet of iron and clay, listen carefully to what I say, it is not limited to the divided nations of Western Europe. That is not the limit to the interpretation of the text. It is most certainly inclusive of the divided nations of Western Europe. But it's not limited to that. Are we understanding that? Now watch that. We need proof of that, don't we? Let's look at the Word. You'll remember that the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah 18 and verse 4, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Verse 5, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. According to the verse, what represents the clay? The house of Israel. Very good. God's people. All right? Then we look at Isaiah 64 in verse 8. We need two witnesses at least. In Isaiah 64 in verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art, our pot, and thou art the potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. So notice that, again, the Bible is showing that the clay is representative of God's people. So what's happening is the Bible is prophesying that a time is going to come that God's people are going to apostatize and walk away from God and begin to mingle with Rome. And there is going to be a setting up of a union of religious and civil power coming together. And whenever civil and religious power comes together, it always equals the same thing, persecution to the people of God. Every time you see that take place, it equals to persecution to the people of God. That's why true Christians will always be against the union of church and state. Now watch this. As we continue in this study, Revelation 13, 7. If you look at Revelation 13, 7, talking about again that beast power, here's what it says, which I thought was very interesting. Remember, the dragon gave him his power. That's Revelation 13, 2. Look at how the beast exercised its power. It says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. When you have power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations, you know what that's called? That's called, brothers and sisters, civil power. You have power over the civilians of the land. But it didn't stop at verse 7, because in verse 8, it then said, and all that dwell upon the earth shall do something else. What else are they going to do? It says they're going to worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so the Bible shows that there is going to be a beast power that is going to seek to, again, compel the people, and the power that it exercises was the union of civil and religious power. And so whenever we think of the image of the beast, we're thinking about none other than a governmental power, a governing power that deceives the people in thinking that the uniting of church and state is a good thing. We must watch this nice word. We must protest against such a union. Now, it is none other than the servant of the Lord that said in Manuscript Release, book 15, page 39, the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. Can you imagine that? And isn't it beautiful how we proved that from the Bible before we went here? That's the thing I always love about Ellen White's writings. I often talk to people. I remember one time I was doing a health meeting at a church. 4,000 members, and we were doing a health meeting at a church, and I remember that we were teaching all these principles, and every individual had a copy of Ministry of Healing, Steps to Christ, every member. Now, we're three weeks into the health meeting. 
The pastor calls me up and he says, Dwayne, he says, listen, man, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem, pastor? He said, well, he said, uh, my elders have a problem with those books that you're using. I said, what books? You know, I'm kind of acting dumb. I knew what he's talking about. I said, what books? And he said, oh, those books, uh, Ministry of Healing and Steps of Christ. I said, well, what's wrong with them? And he said, nothing. That's the problem. This is a true story. And my elders are concerned that if the members of the church see that Ellen White was this accurate on principles of health, it'll cause their minds to inquire if she was also just as accurate on her teachings of the Word of God and prophecy. He said, they have threatened to fire me if I don't stop you from using those books. I said, Pastor, the writings of Ellen White are like a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass does not put something there that wasn't there. A magnifying glass does not take away something that was there. A magnifying glass only makes clear that which was already there. And I said, and that's the function of the writings of Ellen White. And therefore, if you would like for me to stop using that to help be more peace so we can continue the meetings, I will gladly do it and just teach it all straight from the Bible. And he said, do you do that? I said, of course. And then we continued for the next four weeks, and even the pastor at the end of the presentation, that man got himself a copy of the Conflict of the Ages series, hardcover. And so, you know, I'm just saying, what you got to learn how to do is you got to learn how to break it down straight from the Word. And then as you teach it from the Word, then you can go ahead and magnify it with the writings of the servant of the Lord. You understand that? All right, well, here we go. So, in summary on this point right here, Satan is the source. We're answering the question, who's receiving worship? Satan is the source who wants worship, but he uses the beast and its image to solicit worship from all the people in the earth. Are you following that? Amen. All right, now let's continue with the next question. The next question is, what does worship even mean? Because again, I told you, clap, hands, stomp, feet, side, side. You know, people have different interpretations of worship. So we need to understand from God's perspective, what does he mean when he says worship? All right, let's take a look. When we look at the first time, I was really glad when I saw Pastor Ross do that yesterday. I said, ah, he's using the law of first mentions. You know, these are one of the methods in theology of how you study the Bible, and it's a very powerful method. And so it is that I'm looking here. First time the word worship is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 22, 5. Now here's what it says. And Abraham said unto his young men, keep in mind what's happening here. You know Abraham's getting ready to sacrifice his beloved, his son. The Bible says, and Abraham said unto his young men, abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and then come again unto you. Abraham knew what he was getting ready to do. He was about to offer his son, his one and only son, his love, his heart. And here it is that we learn from this, Abraham's bowing down in homage. This is what the word worship means. Bowing down in homage and laying down or giving up something you care about to honor God. We're dealing with the word worship and what the word worship means. It has a lot more to do than hands going up in the air, ways that you and I sing, crying and so on. These things can play their parts. But my brothers and sisters, the Bible has something very deep in mind when we deal with the question of worship. It's about who you pay homage to, who you're choosing to follow, to agree with, to obey, and to serve. Because the word serve or the idea of serving is always connected with worship. That's why you remember what God said in Exodus 20? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. God knows that whenever we bow down and worship in homage, what follows with that is service. And so when you think of worship, you're thinking about paying homage to a being, a deity, and you're willing to lay down or give up even things that are most precious to you for that deity or that thing, and you are willing to obey and serve that deity or that thing. This is what's going on with the word of worship. Now, another way to look at the word worship in the Greek, if we're looking at Revelation 13 and 14, is we can actually look at it right here. Do you know the word worship actually refers to that? 
Somebody says, what, a Datsun? No, not a Datsun, but a dog. A dog doing something. What is a dog doing to that person's hand? It's licking it, licking it, like giving it a kiss, right? And often when a dog kisses or licks the master's hand, that dog is trying to indicate that I accept you and I am subordinate to you. Are you following that? Now, you know why that's deep? Because when you look up the Greek word for what does worship mean, when you look up the Greek word for worship, did you know it means to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand? It's just sad when you think about how that's exactly what Satan wants. Is he wants your submission. He wants your obedience. He wants your surrender. This is what he's seeking to get from us. And again, these things are indicated by our obedience or disobedience. So watch this. When we go past this, brothers and sisters, again, you can, and this is very deep because this is the picture, isn't it, when we think about forehead and hand. You can reverence God while serving a false god. It has happened in Scripture before. It's right there in 2 Kings 17 and verse 41. Watch the text. The Bible says, So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so they did unto this day. So in other words, it is possible to try to reverence God on one side while holding on to paganism on the other side. This same old practice in the Old Testament is exactly what Satan is trying to renew in the very last moments of earth's history through the issue of the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and the number and the name of the beast, to receive our worship, to receive our homage. And we ought to know that such worship like this is rejected by God. God would never, ever accept such worship. And so in summary, when we think about what does worship mean, in summary, what we need to understand is the devil is on a campaign to get all the earth to pay homage or to feel obliged to be faithful and render service to him through the beast power and its image. Our worship is evidenced by whom we pay homage to and not merely by our profession. That's why I appreciate what Pastor John just said shortly before I came up. It is possible to be out of the location of Babylon, but still be in the condition of Babylon, even though we're in the right location. When God wanted us to come out of her, he wanted us to come all the way out, come out of the location and the condition. And my brothers and sisters, we need to make sure we understand this because this is entree. We're about to serve the real meal. This is appetizer. We're about to serve the real meal in just a second. So buckle up. Now watch this. This is why Romans 6 and verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves, yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Our worship is always connected to obedience and service. This is what God looks at when he thinks of true worship. We worship in spirit, that's the power source, and truth, that's the very thin, narrow line of path that we walk on. It is the spirit of God that enables us to follow all of the truths of God and obey him, for obedience is preferred over sacrifice. This has always been the mind of God. And this is what he's calling amongst his people, but this is where the beast's power is trying to deceive our hearts. Now watch this. How? How did Satan pull this off? We, 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 got, we got stories in the Bible like Matthew 7 where, where Jesus talks about a majority of people that are lost. Question, if, if I said, how many of you like cookies? You like cookies? All right, good. So let's imagine that gluttony was a virtue. Let's imagine that it's all right to overeat. In fact, you get many benefits if you overeat. Let's just imagine that was true. It's not true. (laughs) But let's imagine it was true. Here's the deal. If I said to you, I have a few cookies in my hand, in my left hand, but I have many cookies in my right hand, if you were to take the majority, which hand would you take the cookies from, my left hand or right hand? You see a bunch of smart people. You know that many represents the majority, few represents the minority. Isn't that right? We didn't even have to go to the Greek on that. 
But the reason why that's deep is because in Matthew 7, Jesus says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Because he said, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that go in thereat. But then he talked about that straight gate and that narrow gate. And then he closed by saying, and few there be that find it. What's deep is that later on in Matthew 7, what I just quoted, that's Matthew 7, 13 and 14, if you want to study it. But do you know by the time you get down to verse 21, Jesus is talking to the same group of people. And then he says, listen, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Cast out demons, did wonderful works in thy name. And Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. You know what that means? That means that the majority of people that will be lost as represented in Matthew 7 are people in the church. And that's why, as Pastor John said, we don't have any time to be playing games about where we stand with God. The true worshipers need to know who they are, and they need to stand up because there's a beast power campaign that's trying to get everybody to join in this mass movement of false worship. Now, here it is that when we look at this here, how, how, how does how Satan going to pull this? How's he going to get it? How's he going to get the whole world, you know, those who are outside of God? How is he going to get them and then also get the majority of the people in the church? How does he pull that off? Well, here we go. You remember in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, my dear brother Daniel talked about this a little earlier. As well as in Ezekiel 28, 17, the Bible tells us something about Satan. Let's take a look. It says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this weakened the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, in your mind, in your mind. That's where the rebellion started, in the mind. Rebellion always starts in the mind before it comes out in actions. It says, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I'm going to be like the most high. It also says in Ezekiel 28, verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. The problem with Lucifer was simply this. In Satan's mind, he considered what was given to him by God, and rather than laying it at God's feet, he exalted it and began to worship himself, which tended towards him demanding worship from everyone else. And so Satan's master plan to get everybody to worship the beast is first to get you to worship yourself. The same way Christ wants us to have his mind, you better believe that serpent called the devil and Satan, he wants you and I to have his mind. And this is why, family, self-worship prepares for beast worship. That's what God wants us to check. That's what he really, really wants us to look at. Could it be that we are falling into the trick and the trap of Satan of falling into self-worship? Do we bow down? to our own ideologies? Do we bow down to our feelings? Do we say to ourselves that I get the last saying, what I believe is right is what is truth and nothing else matters? We don't even realize that we're being pimped and played by the devil. And he's trying to literally set us up. Because the more we get caught up in self-worship, he sits back and laughs and says they are preparing for beast worship. Even while they think they're getting ready to go to heaven. Can you imagine that? You see, my brothers and sisters, this hits even the people of God. We were told in that precious little book, Great Controversy, I heard it mentioned from Pastor Loma Kang, you need to make sure, if you've never read that book, if there's anybody in here who says, I've never read that book, I want you to hit the person next to you or somebody say, get me that book. You make sure you tell somebody, give me that book, I need that book tonight. Put urgency in their heart. But it's in that precious little book, Great Controversy, that it says as the storm approaches. It says a what kind of class? A large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified by what? 
obedience to the truth. What do they do? They abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. The only opposition is Babylon. And then it says, and they become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. This is coming to a church experience near you. God wants us to understand that this is no time to be playing around. If ever there was a time, you see that judgment hour that Pastor Ross talked about? This is where we should be searching our hearts. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And I guarantee you, self-worship is wicked. God wants us to really look and say, who do you live in? How do you go about making your decisions day by day? Who's the boss? Now, the reason why these points are very important is because not only that, but the Bible takes it even deeper. It says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. But he who is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. That means that we're not just simply called to be faithful, but we're called to be faithful in the little decisions. Because the psychology of evangelism, the psychology of soul saving, the psychology of cooperating with God and obedience is not so much what you're doing during the big events, but it's what are you doing in the little small decisions that you have to make every single day. This is why, brothers and sisters, you got to be careful. You got to think straight. You got to mind yourself and ask yourself, sit back and ask yourself and say, what's the philosophy of how I make decisions for me, for my family, for our home, for our money, for everything? If we really believe the earth is the Lord, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, if we really believe that, right, then that means that you own nothing. Guess what? You don't even own you. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Somebody says, what? Why am I not my own? Next verse, it says, for you've been bought with a price. That price is that precious blood of Jesus. He must not just be appreciated as our Savior. He must be appreciated as our Lord. And that word Lord means ruler. That means he rules now. Oh, I'm going to go play these games. Wait, ruler. Are you okay with me participating in this recreation? Oh, I like that guy. I like that girl. I think I'm going to start dating them. Oh, wait, ruler. Do you approve of him? Do you approve of her? Jesus was, you know, I always say this, Jesus was many things, but he was not a comedian. Jesus was many things, but he wasn't a comedian. Because you know what comedians do for a living, right? They tell jokes. But in Matthew 4 and verse 4, when Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, he wasn't joking. He actually meant what he said. He actually said, before you dress yourself, look to my word for guidance. Before you get ready to put it on your lips, Jesus says, wait, go to my word and see if I approve. Before you get ready to put it in your mouth, if Dr. Shin's around, I know he would say amen. Jesus says, go to my word, make sure I approve. We are not our own. We have been bought, and this is what God wants us to understand. You know why? Because here's the deal. A precious little book, nine volumes of the testimonies for the church, counsels and guidance and instruction for God's people, especially living in these last days. It was in volume five of the testimonies, page 81, that it actually tells us how we can end up getting the mark of the beast. It says the time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. It says the mark of the beast will be urged upon us. And watch what it says next. Those who have stepped by step, yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs. Are we, are we going through some worldly demands right now? Are there certain demands that are being made and some of them are quite irrational and leaning only on one side of evidence? You see, if you and I just simply roll with crowds and roll with the majority, we don't understand. That's beast worship movements. 
if you're just going to roll with the crowd. And listen, I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, I'm talking about even, even something as late as the vaccine agitation. Brothers and sisters, listen, if you want to get a vaccine, that's your business. That's between you and God. You're no less a child of God if you want to get it. If you get it, that's your choice. It's your choice, and you are totally free to do that. If somebody doesn't get a vaccine, they're totally free to do that. But watch beast power thinking. What if somebody refuses the vaccine because it doesn't fit with their political party ad uh, advocacies? Do you know that's beast thinking? Because if you're going to go with the crowd on something like a vaccine decision, I think you'll probably end up going with the crowd when it comes to the mark of the beast decision. That's when it becomes a problem. Are you following? I'm good with people either getting it or not getting it. My question is why? Is it an informed decision? Is it a personal decision? Or are you just rolling with the crowd? Because that's how you can set yourself up. And literally, Satan is setting us up. And I'm telling you, the devil, he's a master trapper. He'll set one trap here and one trap here. So you're going around there, oh, trap, pop, and then get hit right here. I mean, that, that's how Satan does it. He's a master trapper. He sets multiple traps. Our only safety is in God and his word. That's our only safety. Well, I see my time's going. You know, sometimes I wish I had power and I could freeze the clock. But no, it's all right. Watch this. You know, what, what really prompts us to worship self? What, what prompts us, family, to worship self? Because we got to do some serious heart self-examination. Number one. What prompts us to worship self? The first thing is fear of suffering loss. But the Bible makes it very clear. He who tries to save his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. We must begin to have such a deep-rooted trust in God. All we're going to have, brothers and sisters, is a cord to hang on. That cord represents faith. And Jesus is making it very, very clear. He said, look, man, you're not going to be able to make it. We're not going to be able to stand if we're always going to be so overwhelmingly concerned about suffering loss for doing the right thing. And my brothers and sisters, sometimes you got to be mindful. Who, 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 what is it that you're afraid to lose that's causing you not to do what God is telling you? There's some things that God is speaking to many of your hearts on. I know it. I'm confident of it. But the reality is, is that sometimes we're so afraid of suffering loss that we will not do what God is telling us to do. For some people, it's fear of being singled out. In Jeremiah 1, God made it very, very clear. God said, listen, Jeremiah. He says, the work that I'm calling you to do is not a popular work. God says, the work I'm calling you to do, son, is not a popular work. He says, therefore, I want you to go, be bold, and don't be afraid of their faces. You can't be afraid of being singled out. We have to realize that if I stand for the truth and if I stand for right, I'm going to sometimes look like the odd, singular, straight-laced extremist when all you really are is faithful. Continuing, harboring anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness. My brothers and sisters, Matthew 18 is very clear. If we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. And Matthew 18, 35 says, and when you forgive, forgive from the heart. Don't give fake forgiveness. Real forgiveness. And the easiest way to do it is remember what we did to Jesus. If we calculate faithfully what we did to Christ, we will see that we are the worst of offenders in comparison to what others have done. We have raped Jesus. We have molested him. We have mutilated him. We have done so many things to our beloved Savior, brothers and sisters. He didn't die for his sins. He died for mine and yours. And the more that we do that, we can plead with God and ask him to give us power to forgive. So in summary, how does Satan get people to worship the beast? It's very simple. The trap of Satan is to get us caught up into self-worship, even in small decisions, which will impact our larger decisions and cause us to be unfit for the final crisis. And so, what does God want us to do about this? What does he want us to do about this? Many of us are being tricked and trapped by the enemy, and God wants us to do something. And the first thing he wants us to do is to consider our high priest. Consider Jesus, who has been tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. 
And there's a way that Christ came to this world that is ever so powerful, and I love to talk about it. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The story of Jesus is very opposite of Satan. When Satan considered his blessings and gifts, he exalted himself. But when Jesus considered all of his power and gifts, even his equality to the Father, he humbled himself. And he did that for you and me. That's why the Bible says, let that mind be in you. Let that mind be in me. And the question is, well, what does it look like? You know, like, what does it look like to, you know, have this mind of Christ? Or how do I even get it? And Jesus' counsel was very simple. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And notice what he wanted us to learn. I want you to learn that I'm meek and lowly in heart. And that's how you're going to find rest unto your souls. Don't just study about the life of Christ, but especially study and focus on his meekness and lowliness. And when we do that, what does it look like? You'll remember that there's a story of a centurion in Matthew 8, 5 through 10. And when the time came that that centurion wanted his servant healed, he came to Jesus and Jesus said, I'll go to your house. And he said, listen, I'm not even worthy to have you come into my roof. He was humble. He evidently studied enough about Christ that he had the humility of Christ. And then he said, just speak the word only, and I know my servant shall be healed. And my brothers and sisters, speaking that word only, when that man showed that to Jesus, you know why Jesus marveled? Because we're told in the wonderful documentary, or, or rather biography of the life of Jesus, we're told in Desire of Ages 535, skepticism and unbelief are not humility. Implicit belief in Christ's word is true humility, true self-surrender. This is what God is calling us to do. The summary of what God is saying he wants us to do, even in little things, is he says, I want you to learn of my humility. Learn of my meekness. Humble yourself before my words. And when my words counter what it is that you desire to do, that is when you practice something called experimental religion. You trust his word, and you yield, and you obey. And watch the blessing come. It is said in early writings, page 72, faith is ours to exercise, but joyful feeling and the blessing is God's to give to us. My brothers and sisters, we're living in a time where the great grand majority of the people in the world and in churches, they are setting themselves up for beast worship because they fell into the trap of self-worship. But God promised that in the last days, I'm going to have a people and they're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. And so what I have decided to do for the remainder of my days, outside of assessing myself and my family, I've decided to look to my church family and say, by the grace of God, what I want to do is appeal to everyone's heart. And my appeal is simply this. If you have decided to relinquish all self-worship by learning to put your trust more deeper into God, paying homage to Him, honoring Him, obeying Him, letting not your will be done, even in small things, but His will to be done. If you are willing to do that, then I'm just simply going to ask this question. Will all the true worshipers under the sound of my voice please stand up? And as you stand, I want you to know that Christ stands with you. All heaven is on your side. May not our will, but God's will be done. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful for your wonderful words of life. We are thankful that we don't have to stand alone, but we have our elder brother and our precious Savior who stands with us. Help us, Lord, that we might be faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. Please be seated.